Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Wow, that's actually three movies now that are part one this year. Can you guess which one they are? This movie is structured a lot like Indiana Jones, yet people are loving Mission Impossible and just finding Indiana Jones okay. And can we figure out why that is and what makes the difference between these two fundamentally structurally same movies? A lot of people might say something to the likes of Harrison Ford's character was washed up and not in a good place. They did him wrong while Tom Cruise stayed as a badass. Those same people might also say that Phoebe Waller Bridge's character was annoying, whereas Haley Atwell's character was independent and flawed, but also charismatic. But most of those are just kind of opinions. They really don't answer why people like this one more than like that one. The real reason is because Indiana Jones tells you to be excited at these certain moments, where Mission Impossible creates the excitement and tension throughout the movie. Let's look at the chase scene in both movies, because really it doesn't matter how the characters are described or where the plot is kind of setting them, but how they act upon the situation that's being given to them. And Indiana Jones, he usually just kind of brute force his way through something or the power of plot devices kind of opens up the way for him it's i'm gonna punch you or i'm gonna run away and i'm gonna get lucky you can't shoot me for some reason or you're gonna miss all your bullets this takes away all of the tension and drama from the scene from the movie from our character because we just know he's gonna get out of every situation that's put in front of him it's the same way with most protagonists but it's because we know he's not doing it himself, but the world around him seems to be trying to protect him. And that in itself loses its dramatic tension. Now, if we look at Ethan Hunt during his chase scene, anytime the enemies or bad guys are after him, they are genuinely trying to capture him, but we don't ever get to see something by accident happen, or we don't ever get to see them have to hold themselves back. It's always Ethan Hunt that delivers upon the occasion. And a lot of times they're real clever by letting us actually see maybe a frame of what he has in mind or it's actually kind of there the whole time, but we the audience aren't looking at it. There's a lot of red herrings that go on in Mission Impossible. Ethan Hunt uses his own experience and craft to get out of situations. There's never a moment where he is given just an ex machina over and over and over again. Now, if we take a look at Helena Shaw and Grace, you'll definitely see that there's a difference between setting up their personalities for the movie. In Indiana Jones, Helena Shaw is giving us exposition about a whole situation. She's telling us that she's cocky and that she's beautiful and that things always go her way. And we're also being told that she doesn't like her life. And we're being told how we're supposed to think about her and how her father would be disappointed. We don't get anything out of that other than the fact that we are being told what to think. This takes away our ability to infer a situation about her, to form our own thoughts and opinions about Helena Shaw. Now we look at Grace, and she herself has already been proven to have a particular set of skills when it comes to pickpocketing. She can pickpocket Ethan without him noticing, but she also is always looking out for herself. Even though there are different parties at play, she's always looking for self-interest, preserving, no matter how helpful Ethan is towards her, she's looking for the money, she's looking to self-preserve, and she's bad at driving. I'm trying to help you! Grace! which is important because she doesn't fully have the skills necessary to survive in this new world she's put herself in, this spy world. We get to see Grace when she's in over her head or she is actually fearing for her own life. She is very similar, if not the same as Helena Shaw to the T, but the difference is, is that we get to form our own opinions about her through her actions and we're not just being told what to think about her by exposition. Okay, now that we've established the difference in why two similarly structured movies could be viewed so differently amongst audience, how do we think about Mission Impossible itself and all the little nooks and crannies? Spoilers. 
you've been warned. I've already talked about the car chase scene and really they did a great job with all the practical effects that have gone on. It's been kind of a tradition now for the marketing to kind of show off the big stunt that Tom Cruise is doing. So it's really cool to see these practical effects and stunts going on on screen with really great camera work to top it off. It's definitely worth uh, just to watch these stunts alone. And this movie is a culmination of a ton of other Mission Impossible films, six previous to that, and I've only ever watched each one just once before, so I am not all there for the lore or the characters and what's really going on. It took me a second to catch up, but I, I, I did get what was happening beat for beat, which kind of comes with some of the problems that I was feeling when I was watching it that I think others might feel is that it's not so emotionally charged. I think the movie does a fantastic job when it comes to repetition, which I need to talk about more here in a second, but when we're actually talking about like the motivations for the antagonists and Ethan Hunt, it just didn't feel like it was very uh, vibing too well. Basically, the, the way for me to explain it is that the, the AI, when chat GPT actually goes evil and rogue and wants to take over the world, you know, it's very selfish. It's doing it for its own self-interest and self-preservation, whereas Ethan Hunt is being very selfless. Everything he does is for the sake of others. Everything he tries to do is uh, basically sacrificing himself so that mankind can go forward. So it's two different ways of looking at it and they're clashing, but the AI is all knowing and it always knows what's gonna happen. I've never been the biggest fan of bad guys that are always 10 steps ahead of our heroes. Now in this series and the previous ones, it's cool to see our heroes be a couple steps ahead and always be planning and predicting what's going on to so to finally have an enemy that ethan hunt can't predict himself is interesting to see him on the losing end of the things and he's challenged uh more emotionally because the people that he is sacrificing himself for almost seem like it's happening in vain uh, and it's hard to tell because it's just the first part so maybe things will ramp up more when we get to the second part, but I do gotta talk about the repetition. There's there's tons of it here, and it's it's really done well. Like the pickpocketing with the thieving Grace. She can pickpocket Ethan Hunt, and they're always stealing from one another, and it's going back and forth, and goes throughout the movie. So whenever we get to the climax of the movie, and we're given another red herring of, oh, Ethan wants to get revenge on this guy because of what he's done to him in his life, and what he will continue to do, but we are distracted by Ethan's choice on whether to let him live or not that uh, we don't even think about the fact that he's going to pickpocket the, the main guy. And I like how Grace and Ethan Hunt kind of mix with one another and they rub off of each other. Ethan finally steals for himself and is doing it so that he can keep his own humanity. Whereas at the end of the movie, Grace doesn't take the money and whenever she steals the key, she's doing it for others, those who have gone out of their way to protect her and get her this far. It's really well done writing and the story does end up talking about her growth more than about anyone else's, which is why I think like the movie might be more emotionally centered in the second half. It's always hard to, to, to judge and criticize these movies because they're not done. Like the whole movie is actually like six hours long if you think about it. And don't worry, there are still a lot of staples, a, a lot of things that get carried over if you're a Mission Impossible fan, like seeing Tom Cruise run. Seeing Tom Cruise on a motorcycle. Seeing Tom Cruise jump off of stuff. I'm, I'm sure there's other tropes. Oh, oh, there was a... Seeing the mask reveal. Seeing the mask machine break. There's ton, uh, There's just so many that like in my head, I'm like, oh yeah, this happens every movie. And it's funny, watching Simon Pegg give the wrong directions to Tom Cruise. <laughs> okay, I'm done. That's it, that's it. No, but the movie is fun. And, and I, a big reason why I wanted to compare it to Indiana Jones is to express how the movie doesn't just sit and explain the situation that's happening before you. Because it can be very complex. It does a great job of showing and not telling and that's why I gotta give Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning 
a 9 out of 10. Until next time, play nice. Hey, I'm Mario. I like playing video games, watching movies, and Dungeons and Dragons. If you keep getting me in your suggested videos, or you're watching this video right here, consider subscribing. It goes a long way. Thank you.